Hi folks, welcome back. Today I want to look at not really a paper, but the first couple of chapters from Andrew Waterman's PhD thesis, which goes into the design of the RISC-V instruction set architecture. It is 2020 and it seems like it's been forever since we've seen a new instruction set, or at least one that was viable in the real world. And RISC-V is trying to change that. So in this video today, I want to quickly go over why, when they were starting this effort, they didn't just choose to use an existing instruction set architecture. Why did they have to build their own? And then look at, from a very high level, the instruction set architecture of RISC-V. So what is RISC-V? RISC-V is a new reduced instruction set computer architecture that was created at Berkeley. Originally, it was for research and education, but since then, there has been a lot of industry support and manufacturers have actually been building real RISC-V chips and using them in real applications. It is a completely free and open instruction set architecture. The spec, a lot of the implementation details are all available online and free to use with no commercial strings attached. So when you start with this effort, the first question is why develop a new instruction set? And the authors here have two big reasons. The first one is that all the prevalent instruction sets are proprietary. You cannot use them without explicitly licensing them. And the second big reason, especially from an academic and research point of view, is that all these instruction sets carry, in some cases, decades worth of baggage and complexity. And then the author goes over several well-known contemporary instruction sets and why they're not suitable for use as a clean new vehicle for research and education. Let's start with MIPS. MIPS started out being a very risk-like instruction set. It initially had only 58 instructions, but over the next three decades it grew and now has about 400. But its other technical shortcoming was that it was very coupled with the microarchitectural implementation. This was the standard five-stage in-order pipeline. If you've studied a computer architecture course using Hennessy and Patterson's famous textbook, you'll see this covered in there. Next, they'll look at Spark. Spark also started out from some research efforts for risk instruction sets and was pretty simple and straightforward. But it has this somewhat quirky idea of using register windows. The idea of register windows is that you have a large number of registers and each time you do a function call, you get a fresh new set of registers. The problem with this is that once your call stack depth exceeds what the register windows can accommodate, you have to invoke some very expensive code to spill over. And similar to MIPS, Spark is also coupled with its implementation and assumes that it will be a single issue in order pipeline. Next, we look at the Alpha instruction set, which started development in the early 1990s. Alpha actually learned from some of the earlier risk implementations. It was not coupled to its microarchitecture so much and it had a clean design. But it still had some quirks, things like not being able to do 8 and 16-bit loads and stores. Strangely enough, it didn't have an integer divide instruction. And of course, digital equipment, which built Alpha, was acquired by other companies and faded into irrelevance. That brings us to ARM, or specifically ARM version 7 which is the architecture found in almost every mobile device. And this makes it, by a very long shot, the most widely implemented architecture in the world today. Remember that it is still a proprietary architecture, but it also has some technical shortcomings. 
By now, the ARM instruction set has grown to more than 600 instructions. There's also some weird quirks in the way ARM uses its registers. The successor to ARM version 7 was ARM version 8, which is a completely redesigned instruction set. But it seems to have totally abandoned risk principles. It has more than a thousand instructions, and those take nearly 6,000 pages to document. We also have OpenRISC, which grew out of the DLX architecture proposed in Hennessy and Patterson's computer architecture textbook. The problem is that it was designed from the point of view of teaching computer architecture, not necessarily designing a clean instruction set. And that finally brings us to the x86 architecture. They lost mobile, but they are still the dominant architecture for laptops, desktops, and servers. How that came to be has a very interesting history, but as the author quite bluntly points out here, the quality of the instruction set was not the reason for its success. It has about 1300 instructions, a bunch of different addressing modes, and registers with special rules for which get implicitly used when. And it turns out that in the implementation of the chips, the x86 instruction set internally gets translated to something much simpler before actually being executed. And now that we've seen the shortcomings of some of the most prevalent existing instruction set architectures, we can look at the design of the RISC-V instruction set. Unlike some of the instruction sets we've seen, RISC-V explicitly did not want to be coupled with a specific microarchitectural implementation. The second major goal was to have a completely free and open instruction set. RISC-V is a modular instruction set in the sense that it is made up of a very simple base instruction set and several extension instruction sets that add specific types of functionality. Starting off at the very simplest level, they have a 32-bit base instruction set, and this has only 47 instructions, but is complete enough to build an entire modern operating system and all the applications that run on top of it. They have 32 registers, each 32 bits wide, and one program counter register. You have three main kinds of instructions, straightforward computation, control flow, and memory access. It is a pure load store architecture in that all computation happens on registers, and then you have to load and store between registers and memory. So here are the computational instructions it's pretty straightforward. You have the usual integer arithmetic, shifting, logical operations, and so on. The load and store instructions are also pretty straightforward. They let you load and store entire words or half words or bytes between RAM and registers. And then you have the control flow instructions, which let you branch based on the result of a test. These last two jump instructions, JAL and JALR, let you jump into a function while saving the return address or do jumps based on a table which you'd require for implementing things like a switch statement. And finally, you have the system instructions. You could implement these in software, but if you want better performance, you'd want to implement them in hardware. And system instructions let you do things like make a system call, or jump to a breakpoint, or load and store the control and status registers. So as you can see, the instruction set is very simple and straightforward, but yet is powerful enough to support an entire modern software stack. So that was a quick look at the RISC-V instruction set architecture I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.